particular mic I should use. Use this the one. real or the purple? Amen, amen. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. That is what it's all about. Pardon me a minute. You know, when you come into the presence of the Lord, at least for me, you better have some Kleenex. <laughs> you know, um, I, uh, I feel very much today um, like maybe what the, the scribe Ezra felt like. And um, I just, you know, as I was, I'm telling you, I have just really been in the Word. For uh, Pastor Sven invited me a couple of weeks ago to preach today. And I just said, okay, what do you, what do you want for me to, to preach on? And, let's see, I'm watching the clock. It's five minutes to 12. I apologize. <laughs> Hopefully you had a good breakfast. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm preparing for a prayer retreat in Utah uh, the, in, in August. So I was thinking, well, I'll probably just kind of continue in that vein of study. And, uh, you know, God always has his way, doesn't he? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, God led me in a different direction. And I thought, this is very strange. This is very strange. And I had to keep praying and meditating and praying and meditating and saying, Okay, just read me. So I, I said, well, okay, you know, I'm really bad about naming sermons, so I have three different ones you can pick from. <laughs> the first one is stay the course. The second one would be consistency is the key. And the third would be trust the voice of the Holy Spirit within you. They're all pretty good, aren't they? You can take your pick. But I, I want to say that as I began to to write the message, I'm just kind of a manuscript kind of person. I like I have to. It's very helpful for me to write things down, whether I veer from it and go all over the place. But as I was as I sat before the Lord last night and I I uh, I read this passage again that God led me to, I was I was quite overwhelmed and. God gave me this word for you today. Um, God has anointed you, Gateway of Hope. And I, Pastor Ken, it's very, very much God that you made your confession this morning. Because I believe that's right in keeping with the word God has for, for you. God has anointed you, Gateway of Hope, and you are here for such a time as this. God sees your heart and knows that you are a people in love with Jesus. When Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave, the same spirit of love and giving is inside this church body. You have a passion for the lost, the hurt, the wounded, the lonely, and afraid. God has placed you God has placed in you the same spirit that God gave the prophet Hosea, who was called to love his unfaithful wife until she came home to her true love, her husband Hosea. You are loving people. You are loving people into the arms of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This kindness of God leads people to repentance. And your kindness is palpable. Mm -hmm. God's Spirit is at work in this place, softening the hearts of all who come here and the hearts of those you touch when you go out. Gateway of hope, may the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1 6 be true of you. I am confident of this very thing. He who has, who has begun a good work in you yes. will bring it to, the, to completion at the day Amen. of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Probably if I say nothing else today, that is the word of the Lord for this church. All right. That, that in itself could take you for a way. And that is, I had to weep before the Lord when this was given. Hallelujah. All right. And the 
The challenge for you is to believe it. Oh, yeah. Amen. Isn't it? Always. To believe. It, it, is God really saying this about us? And yes. Yes. Amen. All right. And I want to say that God has given you everything you need to live a godly life. All right. You, you and I know that the most important being the gift of the Holy Spirit within you. You know, that God's voice is speaking and is speaking to your heart and to my heart. And if you listen to that voice, you will stay the course. Now, I want to say, put on your seatbelts because we're going on a journey. <laughs> now, you probably didn't get the Ezra comment, did you? <laughs> Ezra would stand before the people and read the word of the Lord from morning till night. Let's see what kind of... <laughs> but I want to tell you, you might be a reader, and maybe you're not a reader. If you want a reader, you get the Bible on tape and you listen to it. But you get the word. I'm telling you, there is more excitement in this book than there is in any drama on TV and anything I've ever read. There is more drama here. And there is more amazing things to be known and understood. So we're going on a journey. Now, I want to take you to first. Kings 13, but Michelle, before we go there, <laughs> I realized after I read this passage and I said, wow, what in the world am I supposed to say about this? Then we, I realized we needed some history. You know, you need to know where a passage is coming from and what in the world is going on. And uh, so I'm going to take you first, uh, I'm going to tell you that this particular passage, uh, I have to say that King Solomon King Solomon, when he was appointed king, you know, God said, I'll give you whatever you ask for. He was a child. He said, I need wisdom. How can I know how to, how to rule a people without your wisdom? Of all the things you can imagine asking a child what they want, it could surely be a big list ahead of wisdom. But when God saw that he asked for that, he gave him that and everything else. He gave him everything. So he was the the wealthiest man in all of creation. And in return for that, God said, now you must make a promise to me, and that is that you will keep my commands, and you will love me with all your heart. And I found, a, I researched, and back in, let's pull up Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. <coughs> You know, before the children of Israel were going into um, their promised land, God had given the law to Moses. And God, you know, God always knows everything way ahead of time. Okay, you and I have just got to get to a place of trust. God knows what he's doing even when you think he needs your help. <laughs> and we do a great job of trying to mess things up. But, you know, God always knows that we're going to try to do that too. And it's always ahead of us to clean up our mess. All right, so here in Deuteronomy 17, now I'm going to read the, the little prompter back there because we have a different translation, so we'll be on the same page. You are about to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you take it over and settle there, you may think, we should select a king to rule over us like the other nations around us. Keep going. If this happens, be sure to select as king the man the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He may not be a foreigner. The king must not build up a large stable of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses. For the Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. The king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. When he sits on the throne as king, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. Keep going. Yeah. 
He must always keep that <laughs> copy with him and read it daily as long as he lives. And that way he will learn to fear the Lord his God by obeying all the terms of these instructions and decrees. One more. This regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he listens. It will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way. And it will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. Well, I'm telling you, how many times have you gone a few days without picking up the word? It doesn't feel good, does it? It doesn't feel good at all. But if you do that a day or two, then it becomes three or four. That's true. And then five or six, and finally you're back at church, and you say, okay, let me get it together again. And then you start out, and then suddenly there's another day, and a two or three or four. But God tells the king, you write down, you write a copy. Because I guess they didn't have the printing press. <laughs> But he had to have a copy in his hands and read every day. All right. So what we find out as we look at Solomon, obviously he didn't do that. Because we find that he did. I didn't know this till I began to research this. He himself, what did God say? I will give you everything, wealth beyond measure. But he himself decided to multiply his gold and silver. He decided to multiply his horses. He went down to Egypt to prosper. And so God was not happy with him. And he also acquired 700 wives and 300 concubines. All right. I would say that God was not his sufficiency. He didn't see he didn't need to do all of this. God would have given it to him without his own efforts. Okay, listen to that. Listen to that. Did you hear that promise? My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. What God leads you to do, that is what you're to do. But when you go beyond that to say, I want more, that's when you get into trouble. All right, so King Solomon was ruling when God spoke to him, and God visited him twice, and he warned him not to follow other gods. But did Solomon obey? And so in 1 Kings 11, let's go there. 1 Kings 11, 11 through 13, we hear what God told Solomon. So now the Lord said to him, Since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. Not his servant. That's a, that's a slap. Let's say you have your own business and you work your entire lifetime to pass it on to your family. And God says, no, your family, they're not going to get it. One of your, one of your hired hands is going to get it because I'm going to give it to them. That would, that would kind of break your heart, wouldn't it? Okay? But for the sake of your father David, because God has covenant with David. And you know, I want to tell you, God will never break a promise. God will never break a promise. Amen. Now God, we're going to find out, God's going to do a whole lot of things. Because he's keeping his promise. God knows exactly how. God doesn't manipulate, but, but God, because he sees the beginning, the end from the beginning, God knows exactly how to have it all come together. But for the sake of your father David, I will not do this while you are still alive. How about that for honor? How about that? He said, I'm not going to disgrace you right now. I'm going to let you finish out your term. I will take the kingdom away from your son. And even so, I will not take away the entire kingdom. I will let him be king of one tribe. For the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, my chosen city. Now, 
One commentator, he writes this, his, the commentator is Darby, and he writes this about King Solomon's downfall. Now listen to this statement. The slippery path of sin is always trodden <clears throat> with accelerated steps. In other words, when you begin to go in the wrong direction, it, begins, it becomes too easy to keep going. Ah. Mm -hmm. One step leads to another, to another. Trust me, the enemy is going to make it very easy for you to keep going yeah. along that path. Mm -hmm. it, it's not going to be hard. What's going to be hard is when you find yourself over there, and how am I going to get back? Right. right. He said, because the first sin tends to weaken the soul, in the soul. It weakens in the soul the authority and power of that which alone can prevent our committing still greater sins, which is the Word of God. So in other words, if you veer from the Word, it's going to be easy to take that first step, and then they're just going to keep happening. You're going to start on a path, and that's what happens. And so, if you're not in the Word, and you're not in God's presence, then the power of the Word won't work. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Your amends would be nice. <laughs> All right, King Solomon, you know he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, when I was in Bible college, we studied the book of Ecclesiastes, and we used a book called Chasing the Wind. And you know, King Solomon said, I've done everything there is to do down here. I've done everything, trust me, no stone unturned. And he said, happiness is not here. I don't care where you go, what you do, what you try, what you think is going to be better, it isn't. The wisest man of all that lived in the earth, apart from Jesus Christ, said, it is not found down here. Amen. And so Solomon, you know, after he, he says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. <laughs> he realized the true meaning of life is not here. But these are his words that he penned in Ecclesiastes 2, 19. Let's see what the... Uh, New Living Translation says. Mine says, some other person will control everything I worked and studied for. And I don't know if that person will be wise or foolish. This also is senseless. So he realized everything he worked for in his life was going to come into the hands of someone else. And who can tell whether my successors will be wise or foolish? Yet they will have con they will control everything I have gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is a very frustrated man. And we find a similar situation. Um, in this, you, do you remember what happened with King Saul and King David? I'm going to share a little bit about um, do you remember how David was appointed king before Saul was dead yeah. all right made it pretty tough for David didn't it he had to he had to keep running from spears and arrows and <laughs> things that kept flying in his direction and so now we find that the man who is going to take over and who's going to receive after Solomon is a man named Jeroboam. Now what I want to do, the prophet Ahijah is going to meet Jeroboam and he prophesies about him becoming the new king of Israel before Solomon's son, Rehoboam, is out, before, no, before Solomon is out of the way. So Jer Jeroboam is actually going to be, he is the servant who God prophesied would take your kingdom from your son. And he is alive. Solomon doesn't like it. He gets word of the prophetic message over him. And he seeks to kill him. So let's go to 1 Kings 11, 29, 30, uh, 29 and we'll go through uh, 43. Like I said, put on your seatbelt over the word. I'm going to get you in the word. Because you know what? 
the word works. Amen. There's a message here today for each one of you. There's a message for the church. There's a message for the church body at large. God has a message for you today. One day as Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh met him along the way. And Ahijah was wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone in a field. And Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and he tore it into 12 pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, take 10 of these pieces, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and I will give 10 of the tribes to you. But I will leave him one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. For Solomon has abandoned me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites. He has not followed my ways and done what is pleasing in my sight. He has not obeyed my decrees and regulations as David his father did. But I will not take the entire kingdom from Solomon at this time. For the sake of my servant David, the one whom I chose and who obeyed my commands and decrees, I will keep Solomon as leader for the rest of his life. But I will take the kingdom away from his son and give ten of the tribes to you. Now, just hold it right there for a moment. This is the first church split. I woke up with that this morning. This is the first church split. God did it. Isn't that interesting? I found it interesting. But I will take the kingdom away from his son and give ten of the tribes to you. His son will have one tribe so that the descendants of David, my servant, will continue to reign. God's faithfulness, right? Mm -hmm. Shining like a lamp in Jerusalem, the city I have chosen to be the place for my name. And I will place you on the throne of Israel and you will rule over all that your heart desires. This is the servant he's speaking to. If you listen to what I tell you and follow my ways and do whatever I consider to be right, and if you obey my decrees and commands as my servant David did, then I will always be with you. I will establish an enduring dynasty for you as I did for David, and I will give Israel to you. He's saying this to Jeroboam, a servant. Because of Solomon's sin, I will punish the descendants of David, though not forever. Because he has a promise. Yeah. He's going to keep the promise. Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but he fled to King Shishak of Egypt and stayed there until Solomon died. Hmm. The rest of the events in Solomon's reign, including all his deeds and his wisdom, are recorded in the book of the Acts of Solomon. And Solomon ruled in Jerusalem over all Israel for 40 years. When he died, he was buried in the city of David, named for his father. And then his son, Rehoboam, became the next king. All right. Now, let's look. We have to look at what happens to Rehoboam. Because Rehoboam is supposed to lose his, his kingdom. Right? He's the, he's the heir to the throne. All right? So here's where God causes the first church split. <laughs> you know, God always works on both sides of the split to bring about his redemptive purposes. Right. And his mercy and grace extends to all on either side if they will receive it. Amen. 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 Good. Okay? All right. So how did Rehoboam get ordained? All right. We're going to take a look. Um... At 1 Kings chapter 12. And I want to say that, uh, you know, here there's there's a change. Anytime there's a change, you know, the people of Israel, uh, can you imagine living under a king who doesn't give the word of God any credence and did whatever he wanted to do? Do you think that their uh, lives under him was a good time? It was very hard. He was a harsh ruler. And though he lived in a time of peace, he was probably the only one who had peace. Because everybody else was given a hard time. 
And so they said, this is our chance to come before his son, Rehoboam, and let's plead, plead our cause. Please, please, give us a break. But the people, you know, when you want to negotiate with someone, you don't want to go to their turf. You want them to come to your turf. Right? So the Israelites said, we don't want to go to Jerusalem. We want you to come up north to Shechem. We're going to go up to their capital city. But do you know what happened in Shechem? In Shechem, that's where Dinah was raped. That's where the, the Hitt, Hittites tried to blend with the Israelites. And uh, that's where all the men were circumcised. And then the Israelites came in when they were at their worst point and killed them all. That happened in Shechem. The other thing, Joseph was sold in Shechem. Okay? And then we find uh, one other event there. See, Abimelech exercised tyranny there. And so now we're, see, we're about to see the kingdom divided for the first time. All right, so here we are in 1 Kings. Let's start with verse 4, Michelle. 1 Kings 12, verse 4. Your father was a hard master, they said. Lighten the, harbor, the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us, then we will be your loyal subjects. Come on, give us a break. You, you're in charge now. You can do that. Reboam replied, give me three days to think about it, then come back for my answer. So the people went away. And so the king Rehoboam discussed the matter with the older men. See, he went to the, he went to the wise ones that yeah. his father had, had used the, the counsel of the older and he said what do you think I should do and he asked how should I answer these people next one the older counselors replied and this is great wisdom if you are willing to be a servant to these people today and give them a favorable answer they will always be your loyal subjects in other words it, it, you can't ever err on the side of kindness but Rehoboam, nah, I don't like that. Doesn't sound good to me. What did he do? He wanted to go to his peers, his his hangout crowd. He was about he was about forty, so it was all those forty year old characters. Okay, so so he went to those that he grew up with and were now his advisors. Next verse. What is your advice? He asked them. How should I answer these people who want me to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? And so the young men replied, "This is what you should tell those complainers." who want a lighter burden, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. In other words, whips with metal pieces on the end. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to hear Jer uh, Rehoboam's decision. See, so Jeroboam found out that Solomon died, so he's back in the country. And he's in Ephraim because that's where he had lived. So he was there. So they all came back to see what the king was going to say, just as the king had ordered. But Rehoboam spoke harshly to the people, for he rejected the advice of the older counselors. Now let me just say that um, God will sometimes let you hear your options but he knows that if you're given the freedom to make that choice you're going to do what's in your heart ah. mm -hmm. right, sometimes we want God to just tell me what to do and God will say you can do this or you can do that but God knows that we're going to make the decision based on what's in our heart Yeah. so Rehoboam man I like these dumb dudes I'm going to be the tough guy I'm gonna just I'm gonna lay down the law and let these guys know they're not getting away with anything. Cook this goose is what he did. Next verse. Oh, is that the next verse? Yeah. Okay. He told the people, My father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm going to make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Okay, here's the response. So the king paid no attention to the people. That was not a good thing to do. 
Because he is serving the people. The turn of events was the will of the Lord. See, God, God laid it out there for him to have a choice. For it fulfilled the Lord's message to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through the prophet of Ahijah from Shiloh. See, the stage was being set for the king to be torn. When all Israel realized that the king had refused to listen to them, they responded. <laughs> Ooh, it's kind of like what's going on in Egypt right now, right? We've got a lot of stuff going on. Down with the dynasty of David. We have no interest in the son of Jesse. Back to your homes, O Israel. Look out for your own house, O David. So the people of Israel returned from home. They said, we're not buying it. Bye-bye. And so they just, they just simply left the meeting with the king, and they went back to their houses. We're not, we're not, you're not going to be our king. Forget it. But Rehoboam continued to rule over the, over the Israelites who lived in the towns of Judah. So in other words, his home, his resting, his rulership was actually in Jerusalem. And that's where the tribe of Judah was. Mm -hmm. So he knew that he was at least going to be king down there. So King Rehoboam sent Adoniram. This was one of his workers. He, go, go talk to him. You know, you, maybe you can get him to change their mind. Well, they stoned him to death. Oof. Okay, so Rehoboam, he quickly jumped into his chariot and fled to Jerusalem. i got to save my own skin. And to this day, the northern tribes of Israel have refused to be ruled by a descendant of David. Wow. When the people of Israel learned of Jeroboam's return from Egypt, they called an assembly and made him king over Israel, all Israel. So only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the family of David. Hmm. Fulfilled prophecy. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Let's see. Is that where, where I'm stopping here? Is that it? Keep going. Is there one more verse? Yeah. It looks pretty when Rehoboam good. arrived at Jerusalem, he mobilized the men of Judah. <laughs> See, when he got back there, he thought, nah, this is, this is not what I want. So he decides that he's going to gather up all the men, get an army together, and he's going to go back, and he's going to make them submit. Okay? Next verse. All right. We're going to, you know, force. He, he's, he's obviously Mr. Testosterone here. <laughs> but God said to Shimei, the man of God. Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the people of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, this is what the Lord says. Do not fight against your relatives, the Israelites. Go back home, for what has happened is my doing. In other words, God is just saying to Rehoboam, I just took that puppy out of your hand. This is what I did, and you will not interfere with what I'm doing. So they obeyed the message of the Lord and went home as the Lord had commanded. Jer Jeroboam then built up the city of Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and it became his capital. Later he went and built up the town of Pen Peniel. And Jeroboam thought to himself, unless I am careful. The kingdom will return to the dynasty of David. See, he's already paranoid. Mm -hmm. I got this baby given to me. I'm now the ruler of Israel. I certainly, some, this ain't right. <laughs> I'm sure he's wondering. He's starting to get a little paranoid because he really knew that he didn't have any right to this, did he? Mm -hmm. All right. When these people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice at the temple of the Lord, they will again give their allegiance to King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and make me their king instead. Make him their king instead. So he's already freaking out, isn't he? Yeah. All right. So on the advice of his counselors, <laughs> oh no. Okay. The king made two golden calves. And he said to the people, it is too much trouble for you to go worship in Jerusalem. Look, Israel. These are your gods who brought you out of Egypt. And so he placed these calf idols in Bethel, which means house of God, and Dan at either end of his kingdom. So in the northern part of his kingdom and the southern part of Israel, which is in the northern part of Israel, there was a place where everybody could go to worship. 
But this became a great sin, for the people worshipped the idols, traveling as far north as Dan to worship the one there. And Jeroboam also, he didn't just stop there with the golden calves, he erected buildings at the pagan shrines and ordained priests from the common people, those who were not from the priestly tribe of Levi. Mm -hmm. Do you know what he did? He, he totally, you know, that God had established the tribe of Levi to be the line from which all the priests would come. And they would be given cities and land and places. And when the people came to bring their offerings to the temple, they would receive tithes and offerings. And that money would be given so the priests could live. Right. They didn't, their work was serving in the temple. So what does Jeroboam do? He confiscates all their land and their cities. He says, don't have to pay those tithes anymore. He eliminated all of that, changed it completely. And so now he said, so the priesthood is up for grabs. We have any takers? Anybody want to be a priest? Wow. That's what he did. That is what he did. Is there another verse, Michelle? Yes. Okay. And Jeroboam instituted a religious festival in Bethel. Will you remember? You know the festival of tabernacles? Yes. That's, it's the season of harvest that they have a festival when the, and that's what happens in Jerusalem that's in the seventh month and the fifteenth day of the year and so Jeroboam said but you know we're in the northern part of the country and our harvest comes in a little bit later mm -hmm. there's blossoms and flourishes at the time they have the festival we're going to make our festival a month later he just totally changes everything, all right? So he establishes his own festival, and there at Beth Bethel, he himself offered sacrifices to the calves he had made, and he appointed priests for the pagan shrines he had made. So, so he takes matters completely into his own hands, sets up his own festival, brings his own priests there, and so he is in Bethel about to make a sacrifice. I think, is that the end of chapter That's, 13? This is the end. Right. So now, all right, let me find myself here. This is good. Now I'm getting to where I was supposed to be. <laughs> oh, let's see, it's just about 30. All right, all right, I just heard stomach growl. If you stomach growl, I'll really make it fast. Okay. Now, Je Jeroboam is about to make his first act. See, he not only considered himself a king, he considered himself a priest. He's getting into big duty. All right. So he is met at the altar. He is met at the altar by what is called in the scriptures the man of God. And I want to tell you, prophecy immediately reappears. For the faithful love of God never grows weary for his people. His mercy endures forever. And the intervention of God through his word does not fail. When people go astray and the ordinary connections between God and his people are broken. So God knew something, something was really drastically about to happen. What did he tell Rehoboam? If you follow, if you do my word, I will create your own dynasty. And he went completely in the opposite direction, didn't he? So now, Rehoboam himself is forbidden by prophecy to carry out his intention of fighting against Israel, remember? But in the case of Jeroboam, see, God's handling the northern kingdom, I mean the southern kingdom, and he stops Rehoboam. You can't go take matters into your own hands. And then he goes up to the north to address Jeroboam, and he vindicates himself at the altar. So here's what happens. Let's look at 1 Kings 13. All right, and the Lord's command, at the Lord's command, a man of God from Judah went to Bethel. We don't even know the man's name. He arrived there just as Jeroboam was approaching the altar to burn incense. How's that for timing? Hmm. Then at the Lord's command, he shouted. He's talking. Have you ever had anybody prophesy to an object? Okay. Yeah. 
He says, O altar, O altar, this is what the Lord says. A child named Josiah will be born into the dynasty of David. On you, he will sacrifice the priest from the pagan shrines who come here to burn incense. And human bones will be burned on you. The same day, the man of God gave a sign. See? Now I'm going to prove to you that what I just said is from God. He said, the Lord has promised to give this sign. This altar will split apart and its ashes will be poured out on the ground. When King Jeroboam came against the altar of Bethel, he pointed at him and shouted, Seize the man! But instantly, the king's hand became paralyzed in that position. He had no control. He had no power. And he couldn't even pull it back. At the same time, while his hand is frozen in midstream and it's paralyzed, a wide crack appeared in the altar and the ashes poured out, just as the man of God had predicted in his message from the Lord. And the king cried out to the man of God, Please ask the Lord your God to restore my hand again. So the man of God prayed to the Lord and the king's hand was restored and he could move it again. You know, one thing that's very important when we deliver the word of the Lord, we can't get emotionally involved in the message. Other than we know this is what God wants us to say, we say it, but we don't get tied to the surroundings around us. Then the king said to the man of God, Oh, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> Boy, I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to use that arm again. He said, Now, uh, why don't you just come on to my house? We'll go have some dinner. Can you believe that? That's what he said. He acted as if the man of God didn't even prophesy over. He didn't even hear what he said about Josiah. He didn't hear any of that. Well, just come on. Let me go fix you something to eat. Let's just go talk a little bit. I'll even give you a gift. Thank you for healing my arm. That was his response, folks. But the man of God said to him, to the king, even if you gave me half of everything you own, I would not go with you. I would not eat or drink anything in this place. <coughs> For the Lord God gave me this command. You must not eat or drink anything while you are here. And do not return to Judah by the same way you came. Oh. So he's just telling them, God, I haven't, I'm under instructions. So he left Bethel and went home another way. <clears throat> Here's where the story takes another twist. <laughs> This is. And it happened, there was an old prophet. You know what that means, old prophet? Yeah. He might have been old, but old prophet means he was, no, it means that, uh, and he was a prophet, he had been a prophet of God, but he was now living under Jeroboam's rule. So I bet he's probably gotten real comfortable, hadn't really done much, hadn't really experienced the presence of the Lord in a very long time. Nor has he received a word from the Lord to deliver to anyone in a very long time. But you know, if you have ever been in a place where God really used you, but you've fallen away from that, and all you can do is kind of remember what it was like to really be under the anointing, to really be moving by the Spirit, it's a memory, but it's not something you're currently living in. And when you have an opportunity to touch and be with someone who is, you're going to do everything to get it back. Everything to get it back. Because once you've been in the presence of God, there is no better place. Amen. Isn't that right? That's right. That's right. All right. So I, all I'm doing is pleading a little mercy for this old prophet, though he's really going to get in big trouble. Okay. Amen. All right, there was an old prophet living in Bethel, and his sons came home and told him what the man of God had done in Bethel that day. You're kidding me. The altar split. The, his hand was frozen. Oh, my gosh. That's, you know, suddenly it just froze up in him. Wow, the power of God in this place. Okay? And so they told him what the man of God had done. They told their father, what the man had said to the king. 
The old prophet asked him, which way did he go? Where did he go? I'm gonna go find him. Saddle up my donkey, get it ready, I'm on my way. This direction, yeah, that's the way, okay? So he, they saddled him up and he was on his way. Then he rode out after the man of God and found him sitting under a great tree. The old prophet asked him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, yes, I am. Then he said to the man of God, come home with me and eat some food. No, I cannot, he replied. I'm not allowed to eat or drink anything here in this place. For the Lord gave you this command. You must not eat or drink anything while you are there, and do not return to Judah by the same way you came. But the old prophet answered, Well, I'm the prophet too. Just as you are. And an angel gave me this command. Bring him home with you so he can have something to eat and drink. But the old man was lying to him. Now I want you to know, if you look at um, Psalm 103, about the angels of God, I read it. How many, how many angels does God have of the whole amount? He has two-thirds, because the other third of the angels fell. They're following Satan, right? But what it says in Psalm 103, it, it says of the angels of God in verse 20, Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength. Just keep that up there if you would. Uh, I'll just read this real quick. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word. In other words, they don't ever tire. They don't, they don't have fatigue. They do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. The angels of the Lord only have, uh, only follow through with the word. So he was obviously not communicating with an angel from God, was he? He lied. Now, Mm. Let's go back to that passage in 1 Kings. Mm. Tell me the chapter again. Let's, we're in chapter 13. And let's see. Let's see. I can, I can show you where, where it is. Oh, we're in verse 18. The old prophet lied to him. <clears throat> and so what happened is... Uh, Let's go to the next verse, verse 19. So they went back together. So the man of God listened to him. And the, and the man of God ate and drank at the prophet's home. Then while they were sitting at the table, the command from the Lord came to the old prophet. So suddenly, he's at the table, and he hasn't had a word from the Lord in a very long time, and now he's getting a word. The old prophet is now getting a word. God is using the man's mouth who lied to speak the demise to the man of God who just disobeyed. That's a pretty bad way of having to come back into the anointing, isn't it? Right. It's kind of like Samuel's first assignment that he had to give to Saul. Or he gave to um, Eli, which was about Saul. He cried out to the man of God from Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have disobeyed the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back to this place and ate and drank where he told you not to eat or drink. And because of this, your body will not be buried in the grave of your ancestors. What that means is you're not going to make it home tonight. No. You won't make it home. No. After the man of God had finished eating and drinking, can you imagine? After you receive a word like that, you're going to keep eating? I might as well finish up while I'm here. I don't know what's going to happen when I leave here, but, you know, that was really good. The old prophet saddled his own donkey for him. And the man of God started off again. But as he was traveling along, a lion came out and killed him. His body lay there on the road with the donkey and the lion standing beside it. 
Mm-hmm. Now that's an unusual mm-hmm. scene, isn't it? People who passed by saw the body lying in the road, the lion standing beside it, and they went and reported it to Bethel where the old prophet lived. So you've got a man dead in the road, you've got a lion standing right here, and you've got a donkey on the other side. Ain't nobody going to mess with the prophet's body, are they? Now, isn't it interesting that the lion didn't consume the man? Mm-hmm. The lion didn't consume the donkey. Right. The lion was there on assignment. That's right. Ah. That's he was good. there That's on assignment. That's good. Ah. And all he was to do was to kill the man, leave him be, and guard the body until when the prophet heard the report, the old prophet, It is the man of God who disobeyed the Lord's command. The Lord has fulfilled his word by causing the lion to attack and kill him. Now he's coming to him. (laughs) Then the prophet said to his sons, Saddle a donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey. And he went out and found the body lying in the road. The donkey and lion were still standing there beside it, for the lion had not eaten the body nor attacked the donkey. So the prophet laid the body of the man of God on the donkey and took it back to his, to the town to mourn over him and bury him. He laid the body out in his own grave, crying out in grief, Oh, my brother. And afterward, the prophet said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the message the Lord told him to proclaim against the altar in Bethel and against the pagan shrines in the towns of Samaria will certainly come true. So now he's starting to rise up, isn't he? He has tasted of the presence of the Lord and God's word, and now he's beginning to speak the truth. Is that the last verse? This one is. Of that chapter. Okay. All right. Well, this is, we know from this story that God has not forgotten the house of David. And Judah is still his throne. Now, I'm going to skip through my notes here. The old prophet, you know, he, he was punished by having to pronounce the demise of the man of God. It had to have been pretty tough for him. But one of the things that that must happen in this story is we want to come full circle because what started out as being a divided kingdom and what started out as the kingdom being torn from Solomon, being torn from his son Rehoboam and given to his servant. And then this comes about. God spoke through the the man of God, and said, there is someone coming who is going to read my word every day, who is going to heed everything that I say, who is going to have a heart after me, who is going to fulfill my word, and his name is Josiah. Josiah. Josiah is made king at the age of eight. I can't even imagine that. And he reigned in Judah for 31 years. But at the age of 18, they were remodeling the temple. Now, how in the world, all he was doing, see right then, and I know from this passage, no one had the law. No one had the scriptures. So they were going on memory. They were going on, what do do you think? What do you know? What do you remember? How are we supposed to do this? They were going on memory. What if you and I, all we had was our memory? (laughs) All right. But Josiah had sent, he said, I want you to go and gather all of the all of the uh, the offerings and the tithes from the people because we need to pay the workers who are remodeling the temple. So the high priest, you know, went in, and of course he had to go into the the temple. He had to go into the holy place, and he had to go into once a year. He goes into the holiest of all. He found the scroll. He found the book. 
of the law with Moses' signature on it. And he brings it out and he takes it back to the king. And the king has it read to him. And immediately he tears his robe, which is a sign of grief and sorrow. And he said, we have fully disobeyed the Lord. And he began to grieve and to mourn. Because once the law gets back in your hands, your accountability begins again. Once the law gets in your hands, you go home and your Bible's sitting beside your bedside table, you're accountable. Mm, that's right. You have it in your heart, you got it written beside you, you are. And so what did Josiah do? Oh my goodness. Josiah said, go and ask the Lord what we should do. 2 Kings 22, 13. 2 Kings 22, 13. I tell you, that is the most, if you want to read, follow through with this message, read 2 Kings 22 and 23. Beautiful, beautiful. He says, go, go to the temple and speak to the Lord for me and for the people. I mean, he acted immediately. Immediately, when you know you are not right and something is wrong, and you now have within your power to get things right and to right. come before the Lord and right. say, I have blown it. He acted immediately. Speak to the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah. Inquire about the words written in this scroll that has been found. For the Lord's great anger is burning against us because our ancestors have not obeyed the words in the scroll. We have not been doing everything it says we must do. Woo! So Hilkiah the priest, Hikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah, boy, that's a challenge, isn't it? Went to the new quarter of Jerusalem to consult with the prophet Huldah. She was the wife of Shalom, son of, okay, we got a bunch here. The keeper of the temple order. We don't really need to keep going on that. I'm going to stop right there. Um, but what I want to tell you is that Josiah went and he cleaned up everything. He left no stone unturned. He wiped the slate clean of idolatrous evidence of worship. He rendered full obedience once he knew the law of God. He was not motivated by any personal agenda, but was grieved by the people's lack of knowledge and obedience to God's word. Yeah. And the scripture says, let's one, actually one last one we'll read. Josiah, 2 Kings 23, 25. We'll read that one. This is what the word says about him. Never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses. And there has never been a king like him since. Wow. Think about, now this was a quite a long spell of time before Josiah came on the scene. Sometimes we get frustrated that we don't feel like God is doing anything. God, you, you made a mistake. Why did this happen? Why, why did this occur? This is going on here. This is going on here. This is going on here. I don't understand it. But I wanted, I'm here to tell you just from this roundabout story. My goodness, we went all over the map today. Yeah. You got the word in you. And the word works. And you, you look at the lives of all the different people. You look at the way God worked in them. God's mercy is for those who don't even deserve it. God's mercy, God gives opportunities to those who could never have had an opportunity fall into their lap. God is gracious and merciful, abounding in and steadfast love. And it is it is for us to hold to the word, read the word as your confession said this morning. This is what God wants us to do. And to love. Because kindness leads people to repentance. <coughs> and God who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. You are on assignment. You are on assignment. 
And what God speaks to your heart, do. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. When you hear the voice of the Lord, that's what you do. Don't let someone else tell you what the Lord said to them for you. Because if God, try, if, if you have somebody try to tell you that the Lord, they've been praying and God told them blah, blah, blah for you, they are not. They are not the one to, because God will confirm in you when you hear that message. And it should come together, but it should not be new. The old man of God, God would have told him, no, it's okay to eat with this guy. But God didn't say that. He let the old speak to him and tell him a word that was not the word. So be careful that you don't do that. God says, no, I will reveal myself to you. I will speak to you. And you know how you know the difference? Peace. Peace. When God makes the call, peace. Jesus will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against him. Amen. 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 And that's all of us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I just want to, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. God, I thank you this morning for your word that when it is sent out, it will go out and accomplish that for which it has been spoken. It will fulfill your purposes. And God, I know that it might have been a lot of reading and a long reading today, but God, something spoke to each one of us. And God, I, I just pray for the hearts of your people here. I pray for the heart. For God, you said that, that our heart is the most deceitful thing in us. But yet your spirit lives in us to renew and change our hearts. Yes. As we sang earlier, change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. And God, I just thank you today that, that if any of us need to come forth, Come before your in your presence. Come before you today. As as Kendrick said earlier, the prophet Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell with the people of unclean lips. God, maybe we need to be undone today. Maybe it is something that you want to do in us. And God, whatever it is that you're speaking to us, I pray that our ears are open. And as God reveals something to you, we simply invite you to come for prayer that we may agree with what it is you are laying out before the Lord. If it's to get rid of or to invite in. If it's to be restored and healed, God knows that process and how it will take place. So let us, let us wait on the Lord. God is faithful and merciful and loves you and will not let go of you until that which has begun goes on to completion. Thank you, Jesus. Let us just wait on the Lord. Come on, if you need prayer. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video of one of our worship services at Gateway of Hope Church. At Gateway of Hope, we exist for one simple reason, and that is to connect real people to a real God in a real way. If that has happened to you while watching this video, we would love to hear from you. You can contact us by visiting our website at www.gatewayhouston.org. We'd love to meet you in person. We worship together Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock, and directions to our worship center and more information about us can be found on our website. Until then, remember, our worship is not over. Our service is just beginning. Go and be the people of God. God bless you, and see you soon.